Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt on Podcast One. RockAuto.com. Why spend 30 to 50%, even 100% more for the same parts that a chain store or dealership might have? Why spend so much there? Why not go to RockAuto.com? It's a family business serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. Everything from engine control modules to brakes to motor oil, even new carpet. Whether it's for your classic car or your daily driver, get everything you need in a few clicks delivered direct to your door. Go to rockauto.com. See all the parts available for your car or your truck. Write doubt in the how did you hear about us box so they know we sent you. An amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Whatever you're funny, Peacock's got it exclusively. Stream classic sitcoms like The Office, Parks and Recreation, and Two and a Half Men. Plus, catch Peacock original comedies like AP Bio and Say by the Bell. For all your exclusive comedy faves, go to PeacockTV.com and get started. Corolla Drinks fans, 818 Rye Whiskey is available now at CorollaDrinks.com. 818 is a whiskey from Adam's backyard, not the gated communities in the same area code. It's aged three years in new American oak and couples a malty sweetness with a complex rye finish. Adam and the team made this whiskey for fans of the show. They made this whiskey for the regulars. Get your bottle of 818 Rye at CorollaDrinks.com. Hurry, we will sell out. Well, in this reasonable doubt, we get into a bizarre, macabre story about um, boating accidents and murder and uh, a family that uh, ran a town for 80-some-odd years. So we'll get into that, talk a little about uh, big tech and their responsibilities. And first, let's tell you about LifeLock. Federal laws limit liability on credit card fraud, but there aren't the same safeguards for your retirement account Protect it with two-factor authentication. Consolidate plans, update your password, and check your account frequently. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day, we put our info at risk on the Internet. In an instant, cyber criminals could harm your finances and your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information has potentially been compromised, they will send you an alert. They're LifeLock, right, Gary? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours with LifeLock by Norton. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by using promo code DOUBT. Call 1-800-LIFELOCK or head to LifeLock.com and use promo code DOUBT, that's D-O-U-B-T, for 25% off. This is Corolla Digital. This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Corolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice. But get them and get it on. Welcome to the best hour or so in the universe. It's Reasonable Doubt. Mark Garrigus is in Parts Unknown, New York. Where are you? South, Southampton. To the Capri Hotel, Southampton, which, which is apparently uh, apparently the happening spot to be. Well, you'll be happy to know that uh, as soon as we wrap, I'm going to hurry off to the airport to go to Denver. But I'm not flying coach, Mark. I'm flying coach plus. Oh, did the promoter give you a little upgrade? No. What ends up happening is they probably provide X amount of dollars for travel. And then you've got to figure out whether you want to, how much of that you want to eat up with an upgrade versus, you know, put in your pocket uh, for right. the, for the, it's for kind the of like home. a per diem yes. for an athlete. You know, they yes. get, they, they get the per diem. They can either eat or they can do something else. Um, so cases that are on your mind, I talked to Gary on the ride in about some stuff. He has a particular sort of insane, story about a boating accident, a homicide uh, that he was telling me about 
uh, on the on the ride in, and we can get into that. But is that, what what's on your mind? Uh, you know, I was um, I was thinking about um, Weinstein um, this morning because I found it ironic that apparently the they're ready to extradite um, him from here in New York to L.A. And I thought how ironic because I just got the um, presiding judge's order uh, declaring the judicial emergency to be extended in the courts. So that, you know, as I've talked about uh, endlessly, the speedy trial rights, things of that nature have all been extended. As of this morning, when we're doing this, um, at the same time that we're going to drag um, uh, Harvey to L.A., I guess to try him, even though I don't know how they're going to try him if the emergency order just got extended. So um, it's just a wonderful thing as a taxpayer to watch and um, as somebody who's in the criminal justice system to watch. Well, the emergency order extended. Um, I'm in L.A. The Clippers are going to play tonight and they're playing to a full capacity crowd for, you know, the first time in forever. And then I heard Cuomo doing a presser today in New York, and he was talking about New York having the lowest COVID positive and test. (laughs) So they so New York is open and L.A. is open. So then why the extension? So if the arenas are open and the restaurants are open, why why are we extending the emergency order? I, I I'm very confused about the whole thing. I uh, I wish somebody would explain to me why the emergency order would be extended when and people would be sitting uh, presumably in custody without bail uh, and not getting a speedy trial. I uh, I, I just I just don't understand um, uh, what what's happening. I mean, the California Supreme Court extended their time to consider the restaurant association and engine companies request to have them weigh in on um, uh, the fact that the County has had absolutely no evidence to shut door outdoor dining that just got denied. So now um, uh, the only place left is the U S Supreme court. Um, And, you know, it's interesting because there's been a couple of decisions this week by the U.S. Supreme Court um, in cases that were somewhat unexpected, one being um, in terms of the um, the uh, upholding of uh, the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare, um, and the um, uh, the Philadelphia uh, case on um, uh, a discrimination um, or supposed discrimination or not on LBGTQ. And I just find it Uh, ironic that the only cases or it seems like the only time we're dealing with the first amendment uh seems to be in religious cases right now and um uh, i i don't get it you you talked about new york and la the thing that new york and la have in common um they both have vaccination rates that are good um but not spectacular as compared to other places Uh, But what you can show is a direct correlation between when they both opened up outdoor dining um, and other outdoor activities and the dropping off of the incidents of COVID and everything else. And I don't understand why that's such a secret. I don't understand why we can't deal with that. Why can't we talk about it? You know, and then it leads into another story that I think you're interested in, the Fauci um, Zuckerberg communications. Have you been following this? Yeah, I actually kind of uh, prompted Gary on that, which is I don't get is- why there's redactions in those emails. If if he's talking to Zuckerberg, uh, why can't we hear what they were talking about? Why why I don't know what the legal um, motivation is for redactions. I mean, I understand certain things are sensitive and they're secure and they have to do with secrets that, uh, you know, our government 
would like to keep from other governments. But what what about why? What's the legal basis for redacting a conversation between a big tech guy and Anthony Fauci? Well, the if you're Gary's going to put it up. Yeah, right there. You can see sometimes I understand the redaction on, as you see in the middle of that, the email addresses for people, if it's a private email address or if it's somebody that's going to be exposed to every um, lunatic in the world, um, you emailing them. Yeah. Uh, if there's personal identifying information, I can understand the redaction there. That's, you know, that's standard operating procedure. You can't put uh, basically a document on the screen, even in a court case, if you haven't redacted per, you know, social security number, dates of birth. Yeah, like that, that. that's that's up there with even TMZ has to tile out the license plate when the celebrities, you know, pulling out of Spago's like we all get that part of the redaction. But what about the content part of the redaction? Right. I don't understand this one here on the last paragraph. And then, Gary, there's another one where there's there's a substantial amount that has been redacted. And it does not appear to me to be a um, something that would just be an identifying feature. It looks like a whole conversation or a whole subject matter was redacted. Generally, the you know the law is on these kinds of requests um, that if there's something that has uh, that implicates national security or something like that, you could certainly do that. Um, but as you can see there, when he says. Um, what is it? One, two, three, four lines are all redacted. That, um, you know, that I think gives people uh, an excuse to speculate, if you know what I mean. So to give some context, the one we're looking at right here is from Mark Zuckerberg to Tony Fauci. And at the end, he says, finally, and it's it's a whole paragraph that's blacked out. And in the other email that we were looking at earlier, they are referencing this email. It's they, This email has been forwarded along to a bigger group. And it says... What's you know even bigger is his offer too, and then they black it out. So the offer is presumably in this email that you're looking at now, and then the other people referencing how big the offer is and what what it what how great it is is in the other email. Yeah. So um, my question is, who's in charge of redactions? Because I guarantee, if Jim Jordan was in charge of redactions, we'd be reading what's on this email right now. So. I always just figure out whose camp is the redaction person in. And I'm assuming he's in Fauci's camp, but I don't know. And I don't know that they even provide who is who does the vetting for redactions. Usually there's going to be a uh, PIO, public information officer. There's also if these were uh, released uh, pursuant to FOIA, that can be a um, uh, there can be an information officer in the mix there as well. So it's an interesting um, uh, exercise. Uh, and you wonder at a certain point, and I understand the uh, uh, the concern, obviously, if there is somebody in the private sector who's writing to someone on the government payroll, why is there a redaction? What is the what's the purpose of the redaction? Who are we protecting? Well, obviously, the conspiracy theorist in me says uh, big tech wasn't they basically parroted everything that Fauci said. And anyone who came along with a alternate theory about where the virus may have emanated from, like the lab theory or had something good to say about some therapeutics, hydroxychloroquine or whatever, what, what whatever someone else said that that was would have defied what Fauci said was pulled off the platform that Zuckerberg runs. So that feels a little suspicious to me. It feels like a little more than a coincidence that these two, you know, it's basically saying uh, it's like, it's like you have one guy who's got the product and the other guy who's got the, the billboard And the guy who's got the product is talking to the guy with the billboard. And coincidentally, all the stuff that ends up on the billboard is all stuff 
is all products that this guy's selling and no alternative products. Those are being pulled off of the billboard. So, again, what to me in this whole thing, it's the the smoking gun to me, whether it's, a, you know, CNN or New York Times or, or Facebook or Twitter or any of these, you know, head of the CDC or any of these guys is why weren't they agnostic about a lot of this stuff? Why were they so aggressively going in one direction with no information? That's the smoking gun to me. Why wasn't, why if, why if you said a year and a half ago or a year ago, this thing came from a lab from Wuhan, why wasn't big tech neutral on that subject? or agnostic on that subject. Why did they know that wasn't so when nobody knew that wasn't so? You know, the, I read a, um, an interesting interview with a scientist who was one of the original ones who speculated that when he was looking at the genome, that there was a, a very small percentage that did not appear to have been um, or could have come from nature and had put that out there, I believe, in January of 2020. And then uh, as he got more information um, and he was um, uh, kind of under siege, uh, he changed that opinion and said it was to his credit in the interview that I read, at least, which was apparently lightly edited for length and content. But uh, once again, you can't get the raw data. But he says, well, that's part of what the scientific method is. The scientific method is you collect data, you have a uh, discussion, you have you get to a point where you have peer review and and then you change your uh, hypothesis or your thesis. Well, the irony of that is exactly what you just said. The irony is that we're not letting people do that. We're kind of directing what they what their thesis can be and whether we can evolve or whether the, um, the discussion is allowed to have a back and forth. You see what I mean in terms of the irony here that the very scientific method that is being described and exalted, which I, uh, you know, I've always had great reverence for, is precisely what is being manipulated. The method of what data do you get? Who's giving you the data? Is it taken down? Is it? Um, are there uh, uh, ways in which the information you're getting is being manipulated? That's a scary prospect. I think. I think it's. I think the overall takeaway in the scary prospect department is even if you're a virologist or scientist or clinician or doctor, whatever, if you had an alternate theory about masks or about hydroxychloroquine or about other therapeutics or about where the virus emanated from, if you had any theories that didn't comport with big tech's sort of agenda, you were you were labeled misinformation you know, at false allegation, and then sent, essentially you were disgraced. You were essentially called a liar and that we're going to have to pull your stuff off because you were lying. Um, that's a little tough on the reputation for of a virologist or scientist or a doctor, but that a theme emerged, that's the scary part. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't that people differed with the theory – it's that the people who were in charge of the PA system in the town square unplugged the microphones of the guys who had alternate theories than the ones big tech decided to run with, which, by the way, turned out to be wrong. That's the great part well, of it. The, 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 the idea that somehow you're going to say, I'm not going to consider or I'm not going to hear um, or I'm not going to, it's actually more arrogant than that. It's, I'm not going to let others hear of these alternative views is to me antithetical to what the first amendment is. Well, uh, the first amendment is supposed to be, I mean, I, uh, you know, traditionally, if you look at it, 
it, it was designed for core political speech and protect uh, projection pre protection of um, the uh, the religious liberty. Um, however, you, you can't just decide certain things are okay, other things aren't okay. I mean, that's not the, what the First Amendment is. Well, also, you know, well, a couple of things. They're also all over the road. So if there's a bunch of information on Hunter Biden's laptop, they're like, well, we can't, we can't, we can't run that because uh, we don't know that where that information came from or how it was gotten. But if somebody leaks a bunch of records from the IRS about rich guys not paying taxes, they're happy to run those stories. So which is it? Well, they're both. They're both. They're both potentially legally um, received. Well, why? Why the double standard? Well, you know it's interesting because um, Ben has um, uh, has a client um, who uh, is retired Secret Service who has uh, demanded on the Hunter Biden issue that some of the quotes or texts or things that were included in an article were just made up. Uh, and, uh, and I think there was a clarification that was issued in a uh, pseudo retraction that was issued. Uh, the fact remains though, that your point is if, and people may not know this story, I believe it was pro publica, which is a group that does investigations somehow got leaked a series of billionaires tax returns and the tax returns showed that a number of billionaires paid no taxes for a number of years. And, uh, I believe, um, that there uh, was done, or uh, I would assume that was done somewhat in the chain leaked it. And that was illegal is the premise that you and I are working from. If that's the case, um, people don't have a problem with that, um, uh, but they do seem to have a problem with any other information if it doesn't fit within their their ideological uh, kind of lane. Well, here's here's an interesting uh, semi abstract thought, and I'll I'll argue for it and I'll argue against it, which is um, if you are. If we're and and most I I believe most all this happened just because uh, as Mike August would say it's an election year this is how you know this is uh, this is how COVID got weaponized and politicized but here's a hypothetical um you know how big a campaign contribution did big tech make to the Biden campaign? by cherry picking all the stuff about Trump versus Hunter Biden versus the lab leak versus no lab leak. You know what I mean? Think about the contribution, if you could even translate that into dollars, how that would help the campaign of one ver candidate versus the other. I mean, it literally well, could have swung the election. Now, at some, well, I, at some I, point, we're going to have to I, consider it a, can, a contribution, right? Yeah. I mean, the, uh, look, you're talking about something that is uh, traditionally referred to as in-kind. And for those of you who don't know, um, I will refer you back so that we can cover that it works both ways. Don't think it's just one side or the other. Remember, in the 2016 election, Facebook um, there was a great deal of information that was garnered and used um, very skillfully by Jared Kushner on Facebook to target to the point, geo-target um, uh, uh, voters and things of that nature. And they were obviously, um, uh, Facebook at least, um, was, uh, was a party to that, was manipulated. And Facebook here um, in... 2020 for that election can be manipulated by the other side. That's uh, uh, w one of the things I always like to point out is, you know, just because today it's happening to your enemy 
does not mean tomorrow it can't happen to you. So understand that the no matter which side of the aisle you're on or which side of the ideological split you're on, understand what is happening here. And that's not abstract when you talk about it. Develop that theory for a second point. Well, what you're saying is yeah. that is there an in-kind contribution by, by uh, basically by kind of tilting um, the uh, the game, so to speak. Well, a couple things. So I believe either candidate can use any tech platform to the best of their ability, you know, geo-targeting, whatever. Whatever it is, they're allowed to do that. Both directions, both sides. Let's see who has the best, you know, let's see who has the best and the brightest running their online campaign and running their, you know, tech tech campaign. Uh, that's perfectly fine. My pushback is when the actual platform starts picking and choosing what stuff they like and what stuff they dislike from one side or the other. Now, you can say, well, they have some responsibility if if one side says the other side is a crack addict and a prostitute and it, it's just a bold faced lie, then maybe there's some responsibility in the platform to police that. But when it comes to things like the lab leak, they have no information that would suggest that did happen or didn't happen. That is clearly a bias for one candidate. Or and or the Hunter Biden laptop. That's something that exists. That's a story that's real. They had no business pulling down the New York Post, I think, shutting down their Twitter account and calling it, you know, fake news. They, that was clearly a bias. So you have to remain neutral and let both sides go at it and may the best person win. On the other hand... Uh, the Los Angeles Times endorses a candidate every year. Now, I don't I don't know the difference exactly like in the eyes of the law between the Los Angeles Times and Twitter. But the Los Angeles Times comes out and says, we're endorsing Joe Biden. And then you can read the news with that knowledge. You know, what I mean, so then when you read a fluff piece on Biden, you'll know it's coming from the newspaper that endorsed Joe Biden. And when you read a hit piece on whoever he's running against, then you'll know that that same news source is against that person. At least you walk in with that knowledge. My feeling is, is Twitter, Facebook and these places, they're claiming to be the the New York Times. They're claiming to be the Los Angeles. I mean, what they're claiming is we're a neutral platform and a news source but they're they're clearly not and my feeling is they they should just declare major they should just go we're a private company we endorse joe biden well the like the la times is an interesting example because they will come out and endorse and it's a sought after or used to be a sought after endorsement i don't know that it necessarily is anymore um you know if you talk to Drew, um, every time they do a hit piece on Drew, he says it's okay. Um, nobody reads it anyway. Uh, but the they have an editorial pitch. They have which you know to some degree is determined by who the owner is. When Sam Zell took over the Chicago-based um, uh, owner of the Tribune Company. They had a view that was different than what they've got right now. I mean, I think anybody who would take a look at the L.A. Times would be hard pressed to say that they aren't rooting for Gavin Newsom in the recall election. I think it's uh, I, I think that's an objective fact. I think they've come out and they've staked out a position um that it's a waste of taxpayer money um, to have the recall and that he should, you know, we shouldn't do it, whatever it is, in so close a uh, period of time to when he would have been 
um, up for re-election anyway. And then to do that, along with mentioning Drew, a hit piece on Drew, what I thought was a hit piece on Drew, um, uh, almost side by side on the website of the LA Times. I mean, you saw that, you remember that. Um, that that gives you pause. Are you? Once again, it comes back to the thing. I'd like to read or get data that is mostly stripped of your agenda or your um, bias. Well, as I've, much as it humanly I've, possible. I've always said, if you're the New York Times or the L.A. Times, why would you make that proclamation and then expect half the country to consume your information? And with some sort of open mind, it's it's really it's it's really a bizarre. I, I know it's a, a ritual. I know you know it's 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 been going on for time and memoriam. I, you know, I, there's certain. I don't know. The New York Times has not uh, endorsed uh, a Republican president for you know 72 years or something. Like it's crazy. But what I'm saying is, is I want to think of you as an umpire. And I don't want the umpire walking out onto the baseball diamond saying, I'm a huge fan of the Mariners. Anyway, uh, Mariners, you're playing the Cubs. Play ball. And then don't worry. I'll just call balls and strikes. That that seems antithetical to me. I, you're, you're a news outlet. You're, well, you, you, know you, what's shouldn't be, you shouldn't have about, a favorite team. What's interesting about that is um, the – Famously, Justice John Roberts, who in his confirmation hearing had said, you know, a justice on the Supreme Court should be calling balls and strikes. Right. Right. And now there's I was reading something this morning where some of the legal scholars, given the two decisions to the decisions that I referenced before this week, are saying that. They're now people who talk about the court as a six to three conservative court are missing what has happened this week, which is it's really kind of a three, three, three court, meaning the um, the more recent Roberts, Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett are in one group. You're getting Gorsuch. You're getting um, uh the uh, uh, what's his name um, and um, and Alito in the other and then Kagan and, uh, and the other two, Breyer and whoever. So three, three, three is a different configuration. And part of, I think, the genius of the chief justice is he he doesn't try to make sweeping um, decisions. He tries to do it incrementally so that there is some kind of trust in the in the U.S. Supreme Court. And I think that that's basically what your point is. How do you have trust in the media outlets or the social media outlets if it looks like they're rooting, as you always say, I, and I love it, they're rooting for one team or another? Uh I uh, I agree with me. All right, I'll set this one up. Gary's got a crazy story out of what South Carolina. South we Carolina. teased it on Beyond Reasonable Doubt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, uh, I, mean, I am curious uh, your thought. It, it it came up and it went away. It was all the rage uh, three months ago. The whole court packing thing. Speaking of the Supreme Court and and you know, what's affectionately known as court packing. I'm curious your thoughts on that. First, I'll tell you about uh, Geico. Do you own, do you rent your home? Well, you do one or the other. And I bet you work hard, too. I'll tell you something that's easy. Bundling with Geico. Geico makes it easy to take your homeowners or your renter's insurance and put it along with your automotive policy. And again, it's a good thing because you have so much to do around the house already. Why not save some time? Save some money. Go to Geico.com. Get a quote. See just how much you could be saving when you go to geico.com and get your bundle on. So quickly, thoughts on court packing. Court packing, you know, it reminds me of uh, the, when people and the current filibuster discussion and everything else, be careful what you wish for. Uh, the idea of uh, expanding the court, and there's nothing sacrosanct about nine, except that's where we've been. But 
inevitably what happens is exactly what I was just talking about. Instead of this being a, um, a monolithic um, behemoth of six, it's turned out that there's now differences and it's really is three, three, three. And for all of the Democrats who've been basically clamoring for Breyer to retire, um, I'm not so sure that if Breyer wasn't there, that you would have had the uh, holding of the uh, Affordable Care Act this week. So I just I, I just think people are too short sighted and want kind of an immediate gratification as opposed to understanding the dynamics. People, the most of the justices uh, who get appointed uh, understand their role there. I mean, there's obvious exceptions on either end of the spectrum, but I just I just think it's a bad idea to to uh, expand the number of justices on the court. Uh, all right, Gary. Now your story that was teased on beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a it's a pretty wild one out of South Carolina. This family, the Murdaws, uh, have held significant power in, in the area of South Carolina that they're from. Uh, it's a group of counties in South Carolina known as the Low Country, and the Murdaws for eighty seven years have. Uh, Let's see here. For 87 years, three generations, one of the Murdoch family members has served as a solicitor of the 14th uh, Circuit. Um, That's like like the Corollas of North Hollywood. There you go. Everyone's we've had district selectmen going back back to the Mayflower. Sure. My dad runs that down. Well, maybe not. Maybe not past 87 years, because 87 years by the same family is the longest in the history of the United States. Wow. Now, they're it's just wild. Yeah. And they also have a private law firm, right? So when they're not working for the government, they are working for the family firm who are focused primarily on personal injury. So on one side, the family is sending tens of people to you know long jail sentences and the death penalty and on the other side the family is suing and getting these huge sums for their clients for personal injury cases Perfect. and uh the the family's business was drawn into focus in 2019 when one of the youngest a 19 year old son uh was out on a boat with five or six other kids around his same age extremely drunk and hit a pylon under a bridge and ejected everyone from the boat Five. Drinking on a boat is essentially running with a gun. It's it's like it's the same <laughs> basic danger principle. It's something doesn't need to happen, but it certainly can. It's it's going to up the percentage yes. for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they hit this pylon. Everyone on the boat was ejected. Uh, five of the people came out OK with some minor injuries. And the sixth wasn't found for seven days. And she died, unfortunately. Oh, Jesus. Uh, her yeah. family. Uh, Go ahead, Mark. That's awful. I couldn't, I mean, that's just, couldn't agree yeah. more. So her family goes on to, uh, you know, well, the cops come. There are conflicting reports as to whether or not a field sobriety test was conducted on these people. But the report notes that they were very intoxicated. So there's questions about whether or not the family's influence you know, played in here. Uh, the family of the victim ends up suing uh, both the driver, the Murdoch family, and the convenience store that sold the liquor to them, actually, which is an interesting little twist. Uh, but subsequently, the the driver of the boat, the, the Murdoch family member, is arrested but is released on $50,000. And that's the, ni- the 19-year-old, right? Correct. Right. His, his right. name is Ryan. Yeah. Uh, he's arrested but released on $50,000 bail. And as he is awaiting trial... He and his mother are executed and left by the kennels on their property in South Carolina. One of them shot multiple times with a shotgun, and the other one shot multiple times with an AR-15. So uh, it's just a banana's I mean, case. That's it's- just, I mean, the, I mean, I don't want to make light of it because it's horrible because people have died. But dog kennel, AR-15, three generations of prosecutors, and um, um uh, in a way, I, uh, the execution was kind of it was like a mob hit, wasn't it? Yeah, according to Gary. So, who would be motivated to kill the son? Well, I guess the parent of the deceased daughter seems right. like they'd have some motivation, but then not sure where the mom comes in. Sure. So, yeah, it, why it, is the mom in there? Did the mom uh, do something in some court appearance or something? 
Yeah, in a further twist, the, the, the patriarch of the family dies a few days after these murders. He was apparently already pretty ill. He was in his, you know, early 80s and, and he passed away. So it's just, it's a very weird story. The, the way you read the articles that have been written about it, it doesn't seem to cast the suspicion on the victim's family as, as Adam alluded to there, but it seems to point out that over the course of these personal injury lawsuits where they were representing people and then the prosecutor side of the family that was sending people to the death penalty, there is any number of people who might have had a problem with this family and ended up taking right. their vengeance. So probably wasn't connected to the boat accident. Most likely not is what's suggested. No, it's wow. interesting because um, I've said for years, and it was not original with me, it was my father who used to say when people would ask him, uh, you know, isn't it dangerous when you go into the criminal courtrooms? And don't you, uh, you know, representing criminals, blah, blah, blah. And Pops used to always say, uh, no, the most dangerous court is the family law court. That's mm-hmm. where people get shot, killed, and people go crazy. And so the fact that they did PEI doesn't kind of ring a bell. Uh, but if they did family law, that's the first place I'd look. In fact, I don't even know if the case was ever sold in L.A., but in L.A. County, there was a judge years ago who was murdered in Pomona, who was a family law judge. And there was also a lawyer who was murdered in his garage, as I remember, and he was a family law lawyer. And so um, kind of uh, I don't know if you remember, Adam, you remember that video of the guy circling the, the Van Nuys courthouse yeah. in mm-hmm. the tree? Yeah, mm-hmm. very good. Yeah. Always family law. Yeah, it's funny. It's because family law is sort of like construction worker and uh then criminal law is sort of like firemen and that construction is actually more dangerous job than firemen. But no one thinks of construction as a dangerous job. They think of firemen as a dangerous job. So any kids listening either become a fireman or criminal attorney, you get paid better. There's more pussy and you're, you're essentially hailed as a hero in your community versus the construction guy or the, um, or the family law. You know, the old adage, the old adage is, is that in the criminal courts, the defendants are um, people who made bad decisions on their best behavior. And in the family law courts, it's uh, people who have made bad decisions on their worst behavior. So. Well, we'll keep you. Uh, it's it's certainly an interesting story. It has it didn't seem to get much traction on national news. I didn't no, hear anything about it. No, it hasn't gotten much national attention. The murders were uh, earlier this month, June seventh, I believe. So it's uh, it's still. I, fairly- I'd like to get I'd like to get somebody on next week's show to talk about this. Um, somebody involved. Uh, I like the story in terms of there's just so many tributaries to it, and the, the other one that I liked was. That story down in where was it, Gary, with the um, the rather large guy who uh, got uh, unfortunately killed by his own gun behind the ear with the uh, woman who is the oh, um, was that in Puerto, young Puerto Rico? Mother. Where was that? I think no, it was in. I think that was in Belize or Belize. Yeah, yeah. That the- story. She got released, and that story has gone off a cliff in terms of the traction on it. I mean, she was released on bail, and that was the end of it. You didn't hear another word about it. All right. Let me give you a quick word about uh, Audible. Forget last summer. That was a bust. Everyone was inside. But this summer, we're going to get some beach towels. We're going to stock up the cooler, and we're going to hit the beach. We're going to escape Audible, the perfect summer partner. Now is the best time to do it. Prime members save 53% on your first four months. Download or stream an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, binge-worthy podcasts, and exclusive originals. We have Mark's book up there. We have my books up there as well. Audible members can choose one title a month. Uh, Yours to keep, by the way, forever. Plus, full access to Audible's streaming library, the Plus Catalog. Hmm, streaming library, the Plus Catalog. Oh, okay. Well, that's what it's called. 
Road trips, beach days, bike rides, or backyard barbecues, Audible is the perfect companion for summer. It's Audible, right, Gary? That's right. Right now, for a limited time, Amazon Prime members can save 53% on four months of Audible. That's only six ninety five a month. Get more out of summer with Audible. To take advantage of this incredible limited time offer, go to audible.com slash rd. That's audible.com slash rd. Well, our internet is down once again, so we can't uh, search things, and I got a Coach Plus seat with my name on it going to Denver, so we'll wrap it a little bit uh, early today. Uh, again, uh, tonight, I'll be in Golden, Col- Colorado, Buffalo Rose. They added some tickets, so there might be some available. You can go to adamcarolla.com for all my live shows, and you can check out uh, our Reasonable Doubt podcast, youtube.com. You can subscribe to uh, Reasonable Doubt YouTube channel if you like as well. What do you got, Mark? Yeah, come by the Capri Hotel, see Naya to tonight, Saturday night when this drops. Go to the V Palm Springs, Elixir, or GG's, downtown, 10E, uh, Engine Company 28, or at uh, LAX, or Casa Tropicana, uh, down at the San Clemente Pier. So, And by the way, Adam, call me tomorrow. I shall. I will do it from uh, beautiful Golden, Colorado. So, until next time, it's Adam Crow for Mark Garriga saying mahalo. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all-new episode. This is Corolla Digital. Well, do you own, do you rent your home? Probably do one or the other. And then you got your automotive policy. How about you bundle them up at GEICO? GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners and renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing because you got so much to do already. So go to GEICO.com, get a quote, see just how much you could save when you get your bundle on with GEICO. That is GEICO.com. Hey, movie lovers, who needs a theater when you have Pluto TV? Grab your popcorn and your streaming device because free movies are here. Pluto TV is your home for movies. Great movies are playing anytime in over 20 exclusive movie channels of action, horror, rom-coms, and more. Watch hits like Saving Private Ryan, Pretty in Pink, and Charlie's Angels all for free. No signups, no fees, no contracts, ever. Download the free Pluto TV app on any device.